He touches turntables and they turn on fire from his fucking hands. You can't even notice him moving. You know what I'm saying? Man. He's constantly vibrating. He put his fucking hands Look. through walls, Rob. They vibrate so fast. When he DJs, it looks like he's got six arms. That's right. They call him Octopus Boy. And when he left the group, I'm going to go ahead and speculate that the sound was never the same again. No, yes. never. Especially and, on fucking stage. And he's incredibly fucking cool and incredibly undeniably handsome. I will go ahead and say he's my dog. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Bobby, Bobby B in the motherfucking you in the house. house, brother. How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. All right, all right. You got... How you guys feeling? Let me turn down a little bit. Am I good? Oh, yeah. Hey, hey, we got you. Yeah, you're you. good, brother. You're good. You got a hey, cool ass setup over there. Over. I'm sorry. I'm in the, I'm, I'm kind of in the dark. I'm getting ready to start my stream after you guys are done. But, um, <laughs> no, his stream's the shit, hey. man. Check out Bobby B's stream. I remember Straight you up. telling me about yeah, it. Yeah, fuck yeah. I'll be telling everybody about it. It's the shit. Hey, thank you for them raids, Shaggy. Hey, let me start off with, with you guys, thanking you guys, man, for all those tours, all those memories. Um, I mean, I tell people all the time, we, you know, we, I, you guys come up all the time in my conversations and uh, I tell people, I'm like, I played Red Rocks because of ICP. Do you understand? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I wouldn't have played, Hey, I wouldn't have played that venue if it wasn't for you guys. You know what I mean? And so the fact that I played that venue and, and not just that, I mean, I went on the best tours of my life. I played the gatherings, what, 13 times or something. Well, people yeah. don't always realize we played the first gathering and, and kept going after that. And, and, uh, That's right. That's I mean, right. just thank you guys for those one. memories. Like. You know, like some people want to stay behind the fences, and I wanted the golf cart. I wanted to go explore and see what the <laughs> fuck, man. And just always thought your guys' shit was so, so brilliant. And I mean, I mean, Brad came back from the first tour, uh, you know, what he did with whatever humble gods or whatever with you guys, and he came back and said, "Dude, there is some shit in the middle of the country that you don't know about that is insane." People are in line with their faces painted. It's a whole fucking thing. It goes off. I mean. And he goes, and I'm like, oh, is, it, is it punk rock? And he's like, no, it's fucking hip hop, dude. And I'm like, and it goes off that hard. He said it goes off that hard. And then once we start dipping in, I'm like, holy shit. And then those tours were just fucking, you know, I had to design a whole like suspension DJ table just so I could be on the stage with you guys. Not because you guys were on stage with us at the same time, but your guys' sound systems you would bring, the side fills would be the size of a like normal front of house system you know what i mean so <laughs> the fucking sound systems would be banging the stage so fucking hard i'm like i can't even perform on these fucking stages unless i figure out some suspension shit and luckily i went to new music seminar in new york in 1989 and this is back and in saw, the day when it was uh, it, it was records techniques back in the day there was no cdjs or nothing so uh, or, or serato <laughs> yes yeah or serato or any of that we were using real, real records readers. right that and, is, uh, that is I luckily shit. I saw Clark Kent in 1989 in New York uh, do a Afro's record release party, and he had the suspension, like these wood tables with rubber bands all stretched, like sus suspending his tables, and he's rocking shit like South Bronx, the South South yeah. Bronx, the bridge, the bridge, yeah, yeah. the South South Bronx, and, and dude, hey, let me say this too, one of my highlights of my whole shit is the after party we did with you guys, and me and Shaggy got to DJ that shit together. Hell yeah. That shit, that shit is like, I'll never forget that. The after you know parties yeah, are the shit, man. Hell yeah. yeah. Hell How many yeah. people get to DJ a party with Shaggy too, though? Hey. You know what I mean? <laughs> or, 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 or stand next to uh, uh, Jay and watch groups like uh, Ice Cube perform. You know what I mean? Hell or yeah. Little John. You know what I mean? That's that's what you get at the gathering. You're literally standing next to Violent Jay and, and Shaggy too, though, watching like legends, and it's just like, <laughs> This shit is brilliant, you know what I mean? Fuck, With yeah. 22,000 people standing in front of me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, Bobby B, man, we're going to have to gonna have to jump right into this, man. Yeah, um, we're about to switch the turn. The table's about to turn real fast. Yeah, we're, we're, we're hey, gonna it, go it's all good. good. Good memories to bad ones real quick here, but we need to know when you started noticing cracks in the foundation of, of the Cottonmouth Kings, brother. You've been in there from day one, damn near. And uh, when did you, I know it was a, a scent for a long time, many, many years. And then it sort of, when, when did cracks start to appear in the, in the structure that is Cottonmouth Kings? Um, you know, it, that's a good question, man, because for me, it was tw 20 years was my, I was already doing music for a while. So, you know, it was 20 years of like putting my head down and making that ship drive forward and like making sure we did every show and got paid for every show, whether we were in Australia or Japan or on tour with you guys is like, you know, I tried to like be the solid foundation for not just me, but in Cottonmouth Kings, but everybody on the label, 
So I tried to take care of everybody. I mean, when we were on, on tour with, with you guys and even groups that are, were on your label, like I tried to take care of them. I recorded their whole, re-recorded their show and made levels right and shit like that. So, Brother, you've always uh, been one of the coolest motherfuckers on earth. No, no <laughs> doubt. Before you say anything, I just want to say one thing. I, I, got, I got to fucking stroke your meat right quick. Like, w when, when you were out, dog, you know what I'm saying? When, when you were, when, like, we do like go on tour with Cottonmouth Kings and you weren't there no more, that fucking sucked, dog. I would look forward to seeing you on them fucking tours. You know what no I'm doubt, saying? No doubt, man. Smiling face. That's Every time you walk in the room, the karma ri rises. I, I just And it was understand. noticeable as fuck. I don't understand how anybody couldn't get along with you, brother. You just S always been super cool, man, you know? And then we understand infighting. Everybody, every large number of people, there's a crew has infighting. But when did the infighting become threatening, you know what I mean? To, to, there, there, there was a few, I mean, personally, there was a few things as far as like me trying to bring my own manager to the plate and getting denied of that. Somebody to actually watch out for me because when people start seeing who was managing the group and running the label, they were like, that is not right. That's red flag shit. Yeah. And I got people in my family like Gary Gersh who actually signed the Cottonmouth Kings that were like telling me, you know, I helped you guys kind of do some of this stuff, but it, it, shit, it's not right over there at Suburban Noise. And, you know, in 99 Rips, my first record was actually paying the bills over there. It was the, it was the thing like paying the rent was that the first was record. Cold, over there. And uh, so when I tried to bring my own manager in and all of a sudden, like people like Brad, who didn't even give a fuck about social media at the time, uh, like, you know, people were getting blue checks and Wikipedia pages. And here this dude is not letting me bring a manager in Tell me he's gonna manage my whole shit, and I'm being kind of left behind, and I'm working hard. You know what I mean for everybody. Now, who was the deck? Who was? I, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know what year it was, but shit started getting weird. You know what I mean? And and and. Who was objecting to you bringing a manager in? Uh, basically with Kevin and Brad. Both of them were. I mean, they, they nah, you don't need her. He, he, she's now actually married to Mixmaster Mike, so. Oh wow! <laughs> I grew up. I grew up with her, so. Yeah. You know, people like her, uh, Violet Brown, who worked at the label for what two weeks or something before I was told uh, somebody got her a job at Strange Music because she was a better fit. If you get a legend like Violet Brown on your team, you fucking keep her. You know what I mean? Yeah. I grew up DJing shit, parties for Easy and shit like that with Violet Brown. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. So they so, had, so they had a problem with that, and, and um, but but so was that the the beginning of the end for you? Was is, did that crack eventually grow into something? No, really no, terrible? no, no. Was I wasn't something? ready to turn my back on on the like you guys talked about the legacy, and, and dude, like to be honest, to even talk about it with you guys, hey, to be talked about with you guys, I'm like short of breath because it's such a fucking gnarly thing for me, man. I got. I got fucked really bad, you know what I mean? My dudes call, that called me family. So, yeah. you know what I mean? Brother, what happened? family, this, that, that, that. You guys know, you guys, you guys watched it go down. So, you tell, know what I mean? Tell, and I'm not disrespecting anything you guys said before I came on as far as like, you know, this dude did this, this dude did this. I'm not taking away from what people did do and what people did make happen. I'm just telling you guys, there's not a lot of honesty and a lot of, uh, layers being uncovered it's all like let me catch my breath <laughs> who, 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 I, who, 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 no, I know what i know what you're going through dog. i said adrenaline kicking dog who, i know what that i know who, what um, about that when you say when you say you got when you say when you say you got funk tell us the story in, in what way how did how did what was the um, breaking point in and who fucked you you know let's, okay, okay so so you know like these dudes weren't the ones finding all the talent you know what i mean too Rude, I grew up with Too Rude. I grew up with Kona Gold. I grew up with One Session. You know, uh, Chucky Chuck was introduced to everyone through me. I was the one that found out about Big B, Big B through the 187 dirt bike ride, you know, when he had 187 through dirt bike people like, like Dave, uh, Porno Dave and people like that, who actually beat Homeboy up later on for burning one of the dirt bike riders and doing some shady, like, video shit. You know what I mean? Yikes. I don't know. I don't want to say a bunch of names on here because I don't want nobody coming after me legally and shit. No question. That's how gnarly it shit. Lives were threatened. I'm going to tell you that. Lives were fucking threatened. So what, that's what why point? you guys are like, it's the fucking legacy. It's the legacy. 
I get it. But at the same time, when somebody threatens my life, fuck, man, it's a gnarly deal. When somebody... Yeah, how do you go back to, from that, right? When somebody's, when somebody's supposed to be watching out for my back, and I'm on the tour bus at 2 in the morning, and there's a video on the satellite, and it's a movie. It's a, it's a Marky Mark movie. I don't remember the fucking name, and I should. So, uh, so somebody, th this somebody movie, in the band uh, threatened you? Check this. Uh, no, and I don't want to say no names. It wasn't nobody in the band. So the movie's, the movie's ending. And I said, hey, BJ, who is this? What is this? He said, it's a Marky Mark movie. It's on the satellite in our tour bus, just ending. And the credits are going up the screen. And I said, is this the audio from the movie? You know, you know, in the tour bus, you could be it on like maybe, maybe you're on a CD or something. Yeah, shit. yeah, of course. No, that's, yeah, that's, that's the movie. D-Lo, come here from the back of the bus. Him and Kona Gold come running up. I said, what is this? He said, that's a Cottonmouth King song me and Judge Deer on. I said, that's, that's you right there. He said, that's me. I said, that's on this movie. You know about it? Because we didn't have very many songs on no movies or no shit, right? I mean, we had Suburban Life back in the day or whatever. So I said, let's see who's, who gets the credit for this one. And it was uh, our former manager's name and his clothing company, Productions, for the credit on the song. Wow. Oof. <laughs> you talk about a red fucking flag. You talk about a red flag not very, very, very far into our careers when I have pe experienced people, people like Tommy Lee and people like that telling me, yo, dude, how do you guys make any money? You guys, meet, you guys tour all year to make, like, I don't live in a good neighborhood. I still don't live in a good neighborhood. You guys tour all year to make that much money, B? I said, yeah, man, Tommy, I don't, I don't have a lot of money. I'm telling Tommy, take me on a DJ gig, dude, because I need to make some extra cash. I have no money coming in. All my publishing's been ripped off. All my royalties are gone. A lot of times I would co-produce most of those songs by, you know, scratching on shit and then adding 808s and bass lines and shit like that. That's co-producing. So when I said, hey, man, I need my, I need my, my publishing on this song. Ah, uh, nah, man. It's, it's all Kuma guy and Brad. I said, Brad? Brad don't make no music. Why would he get publishing on the music if I'm the one adding all this shit? You're just the fucking DJ. Wow. Oh. That's it. <laughs> right? Right. And dude, keep in, keep in mind, before you guys say former fucking interviewee started this shit, he didn't have nothing to do with, with us when we made Royal Highness. He, and matter of fact, Kuma, we didn't even know Kuma guy when we made Royal Highness. That shit was made off my turntables with a couple keyboard players. I've always known you do beats, though. I've always known you do the beats. Yeah. So, so you were getting screwed on that? Dude, song records would come out, and, and you know, we're, we're in the bus, usually, opening the fucking artwork, and I'd say, what's on the run say? What size of, that, size of an asset? What, what does this song say? What? It says, produced by Kuma Guy and Daddy X. Fucking get on the phone. Yo, dude. Oh, it's just a typo. Oh, man. Well, <laughs> guess what, man? My BMI checks, somebody told me they were rerouted to some other address in, like, Burbank or somewhere. You know what I mean? All my checks were diverted for how many years? And then when I got, like, oh, well, we'll send you the recoup, it was hundreds of dollars, dude. Wow. At the same time, if you ever have a manager, and you guys, this is kind of a gnarly thing. Think about if you're a manager of all those years, and I'm not going to say no names, but think about if he had his own clothing company. And he's like, yeah, dude, ICP.com, at ICP mention, you know, Instagram, Facebook, blah, 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 blah. Check out my shit. Here's my logo. Here's my clothing company. Your manager's shit. Not, not the hatchet, not no ICP logo, not nobody's, none of your artist logo, his logo. That's going to fuck you out of how much of your income came from merchandise, Jay? Wow. Yeah, how crazy. much of your, your guys' merchandise had Rob? I'll never forget the day I was in the car with Rob in the Suburban or whatever it was. 
and we were rolling out. We played Cleveland, I think, and you're like, there was like 6,000 people there. Yeah. You know, we made a good amount of money last night. And I'm not going to throw no numbers out, but, but I said, wow. And, and he said, yeah, dude, merchandise. You guys need to step up your merch game. You see our merch booth is fucking 75 yards long sometimes, right? And I'm like, nothing but respect, dude. It's insane. You guys have how many items? The goddamn hockey jerseys, the fucking hoodies, the but but that I'm like, you motherfuckers. And dude, that's why people like Ice Cube and Buster Rhymes and all these motherfuckers like there's nothing but respect, dude. Nothing. But, I have a hard hardcore hip hopper over here with one of the dudes who was actually burned in the whole shit one session. And I'm gonna tell you about, about dudes like this too. I, I got these dudes deals, you know what I mean? For certain records, we would go on tour. And I would sign four or five, six hundred of them. People bought them online because it just came out and it's Bobby B's homies and it's it's the dude from the neighborhoods. The idea for the Cottonmouth Kings came from the neighborhoods. So it's these dudes, whoa, with Tri-State, who fucks with Planet Asia and West Side Gun and fucking killers, right? You know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> Bro Bro Real deal motherfuckers. The dudes who Eminem and Jay-Z are fucking with right now. That's who Tri-State fucks with. And he's part of one session who is Sessions the kid who's sitting right here with me. So, and I would come home from tour and I was like, yo dude, so when did they get a little bit of that money? And he would say, what money? They only sold 39 records. I was like, Damn. motherfucker, I signed 39 the first day. Yeah. At the, at the meet and greet at 420 that I had to go to, you remember? Not that I had to go to, cause God bless the fans and the people I got to meet doing that. And, and God forbid if somebody said, I want to be a DJ or I want to, hey, dude, you think we can go up there and check out your turntables? You guys probably seen me do it. I'm like, we can't disrespect what ICP's got going on up there, but yeah, let's go on stage and trip on the turntables. I'd have little kids up there scratching and shit. And like, I love that shit. You know what I mean? Like touring with you guys was insane. When I tell people, yeah, man, they had two or three fucking diesel trucks just full of Fago. They said, <laughs> wait, what, what do you mean? And I got to show them a video because unless you have ex experienced the ICP show, you don't fucking know what's up. You don't fucking know what's up. Like you guys, this shit is OG as fuck. So brother, them, I'm standing there with Violin J next to the side field watching fucking Ice Cube and, and, and Lil Jon perform. And I got I damn near got nauseous because the side fields were bumping so fucking hard. <laughs> and the front of house is lined with, I told him, man, you go on tour with ICP, your shit's gonna be bumping, bumping. <laughs> like, Brother, that shit me... is huge for me, man. Hey, that shit is huge for me. So it was just like, you guys just kept it, it blowing my mind, tour after tour after tour after gathering after gathering. I'm like, you know what I mean? Awesome, I mean, there's brother. nobody like you guys. There's nobody like you guys in the world, man. I'm, we, hey, I'm man, we up. appreciate that to, to no end, brother. We appreciate that to no end. You, you know, man, listening to your story, you know, we're talking about how, you know, everybody should put it aside whatever their problems are and pull it together, you know, and they should. But you know what? That's a lot fucking easier said than done oh, when yeah. you're talking about years of animosity you know what i mean like not getting paid for years always expecting to get paid well and nonetheless and, getting your life threatened and, and it don't for happen. Real then when you fall well. out people are threatening each that's other that's why hey thank you jay thank you man and then and, and, and like and that's why i don't want to disrespect like what you guys said before or what you do you know you're telling kevin zinger like shit happened because of you not from the very beginning but yeah, it was nice to get a manager that knew how to get us on tour. He denied us from doing tours in Europe, which fucking shot us in the fucking foot later because you, you guys know what, as well as I do, a lot of groups don't even tour the States no more. They go to Europe twice right. a year and make all their fucking money. Festival like like Limp Bizkit will go over there and make a half million, quarter million dollars each guy and just come home and be like, yeah, we don't even need to play shows over here. <laughs> we go over there and play for 300,000 people and come home with our loot. And I'll never forget you guys going, yeah, the tour buses over there suck. You know what I mean? But, but <laughs> they do. Yeah, hey, they still do. <laughs> uh, I, I got a good memory, man. I remember everything. Like, I mean, literally riding in the car with you, Rob, but during the day, like to somewhere. Yeah. And I'm just like, fuck, and just soaking it all up going, damn, I'm in, the, I'm in the car with Jay's bro, like tripping. You know what I mean? Like, right, this yeah. is fucking cool. And that's, that's a lifelong memory for me, man. And then, you know, we're playing Red Rocks and, and dude said, somebody said, I think it was maybe our sound guy was like, hey, dude, we need help getting all the gear up the hill. And I go, oh, oh, yeah, our Finger shit. Needs no, not our shit. 
ICP's sound system needs to be brought up in little <laughs> trucks. And dude, I was out there for five hours loading in, bro. I loved it. I was fucking, fuck yeah, let's do this. Let's get the sound system up there and rock this bitch. And dude, motherfucking dude. And your guys' dude put on it's Peter Gabriel's slipper and fucking made my, made my stomach nauseous. And I was like halfway up the fucking bleachers, man. I was like... <laughs> Dude, lifelong <laughs> with you guys, man. So this was a super honor, man. And, and I hate to even go to like positive because I know we're trying to get to the dirt and the bad shit. And I hope we ex <laughs> expose that by saying like, if you got a, a dude who's your manager who's pushing his own shit, you're fucked. That's why I tell people online and, and, and you know, I'm not talking shit online. I mean every fucking word of it. Like, I'm not talking shit. I'm telling you guys facts and I'm telling you guys the truth when I tell you guys. We got fucked, man. And and I took and I sat on an airplane ride. To, you know, we played Japan 14 times. I, I mean, 12 times as Cottonmouth. I went over there with uh, Richter and Loke twice as Kingspade. Hey, brother. So you, I'm you, sitting you, next. I'm sitting next to Kevin Zinger's partner in SRH, Ryan White, for a nine-hour flight. And after he had a drink or two or whatever, he got to know me a little bit. He said, "Yeah, man, we were going to claim bankruptcy when we met you guys." We couldn't sell SRH in our hometown, right? He's like, we were going to claim bankruptcy. You guys wore it the first show on stage. We got like $2,000 worth of order the next day. Pretty soon, we had you guys on tour with Goldfinger everywhere you fucking played. Lincoln, Nebraska, didn't matter, Omaha. He goes, we would get $4,000 worth of orders the next day. I thought goes, for sure that was your guys' shit. Come off King shit. Exactly. I, I thought it was. S SR he told me, SRH exists because of you guys. And I said, oh, well, cool. Don't worry. Now, SRH, Christmas is coming. SRH. Hey, hey, I was, this, is, this is what I was told. Christmas is coming. We're going to hook you guys the fuck up. Watch this. Yeah, SRH. SR, you know what is, I got? Uh, wait, wait, wait. What? I got a certificate. SRH. No, no. I got a, I got a $500 check. $500. <laughs> this is after oh, I was told we made them millions of dollars. Wow. I got a $500 check and a certificate that said, I'm now part owner of this company. I'm, I'm, me and the rest of the Cottonmouth Kings are 0.0001% of the whole company, Damn. the whole band. So they wow. could have sold it for $100 million, and we would have got pennies as the band. Pennies. Yeah, wow. Guess wow. what? When the lawsuit was going down and all those certificates were turned into the team of lawyers, the certificates were fake. Oh, we didn't, we didn't even know. We didn't even know that. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. <laughs> so SRH is a clothing. I don't mean to laugh. Man. I'm, so, it's not I'm, funny, so fucking, but... hey, I'm so fucking glad I, I got to talk after homie, after this dude who did all this. I'm so it's, fucking it's, glad. It's, you guys know now there's a major motion picture out there that has a Cottonmouth King song playing in the credits at the end that has his name going across to it and his clothing company's name. That's yeah. fucking fraudulent, man. That's fucking fraudulent. So, so when, I, when I've been doing music for 34 fucking years and I don't got a fucking Wikipedia page or a fucking blue check by my shit, that means my fucking manager of 20 years failed me. This wow. motherfucker failed me in every fucking way. And this is coming from dudes who got golden platinum records all over their fucking house. They know the music industry inside and out and plenty. Pl and the pl Trust me, I know plenty of them. Wow. Trust me. So yeah. SRH is, is it, what? It's, right? a, it's a clothing and production company that uh, Ke Kevin Zinger owns. Like, it's his company. Like, yeah, and they do, like, uh, merchandise for, like, other groups. They do merchandise. That, they're not on the label, though, right? Like, and and he, makes, he makes their bands. They do now. He, ma he does these things called the, the, the festivals, right? For, like, and he makes all these bands come and wear his shit and, and then basically fucks all the bands out of selling their merch because now the, now the people are, like, Wait, man, I want to support these guys and those guys and those guys and that guy and that guy. What do I do? Oh, I might as well buy that shirt he's got on. That must be his shit. Just like you guys just said, I thought it was your shit. No, that's not our shit. Mm. Imagine if Alex had his own clothing company. Jay, you would have fucking sliced right. his neck open, right. bro. Wow. And, and threw him away. Threw him, you would have threw him to the wolves. So you guys didn't get none of the merch? Our, our own merch? Yeah. Cam, Cam, we, we would make we, we we would make a percentage of what we made on tour, but we would later find out. Well, he took a percentage of before you guys left, and he took a percentage of what you guys made, and you know, like shady shit went down. 
Like during the during the lawsuit, some girl ends up at some mansion in Malibu, and she's like, "Guess who was sitting next to that dude? Your old tour manager, who's supposed to be like one of Brad's best friends." He's like, "Aren't you guys going through a lawsuit? Wait, this dude is sitting next to him at a barbecue? Like shady shit, dude. You guys don't even know how like how much shit came out." Wow. And it's like for for like this dude and all these other artists, but like basically just to, I'm the only one saying shit, guys. I'm the only fucking one out of out of like 27 of us. Some of these bands are everybody. I, I mean, I know numbers, and I'm not going to sit here and spit numbers of why like why certain people aren't in prison, or maybe like why certain people are lying to people. I, I think he actually drove Uber for two weeks to like just show people that he doesn't have any money. Fuck, he took all the money from the catalog, all of it. And then the other dude is working out something for Richter and Loke. I said, well, yeah, they got lyrics on the shit, but damn, who co-produced and produced a bunch of this shit? Like, he ain't working shit out for me? And, and, and he can't say, well, I've tried to reach out to him. Because no, when all the fuckery went down, I tried to reach out to that motherfucker via email, via text, calling him for three or four months straight. And then after that, I was just like, here in my house by myself going, what do I do? I'm gonna lose everything, I have no income. This dude is like, I'm pretty sure he basically just tried to ruin my fucking life, man. Like, so it's really gnarly, man. So uh, yeah, I had to sit here and I like, listen. And, and you know, my, my boy's like, you should listen to what the fuck is being said on there. You know what I mean? Wow, that's And really it was gnarly, deep, by the time you guys got to me, I was out of breath. Cause it's <laughs> that gnarly to me, man. To be fucked, it, 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 it's fucked like around. To be fucked around for life, but life changing amounts of money is super gnarly, man. Don't think yeah. I didn't think about calling you guys for fucking help. Yeah, no, no doubt. And, and, and you know, I we, really did. We knew there was some scandalous shit going on, but who would have known? You know what I'm saying? That the, the rabbit hole would have been that scandalous. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. Now, now, yeah, what, man, what, and, Bobby, what's your yeah. take on uh, what's your take on Brad X? Like, where do you know where Brad X is today? And um, what is your opinion of, um, you know, like, wh 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 what's the story on Brad X, basically? So, Brad did fall down that thing of, like, being there and being the dude who was like, yeah, he had, he had our manager running the label. Fucking massive red flag. Don't ever do that, man. Like, I thought about holding master classes on, like, what not to do in the music industry. Just because I got fucked around in the neighborhoods, too, with this dude. Like, we got burned, too. You know what I mean? And um, so we, that was like this, what, the third time I've been burned or something. And like this time for like huge amounts of money, like life changing amounts of money where I'm like reaching out for help, recording, doing anything I fucking can. But at the same time, I'm like going into depression because when people call you brother and this kind of stuff and this family thing and like, you guys know I put my fucking head down and worked hard out there, man. Like I just didn't bring like two turntables and a mixer out there. I brought fucking like three sets of gear just in case we had an after party. Good, just in case something broke. I brought like six sets of needles. I got a sponsorship by fucking Vestex, my own sponsorship. Wow. Nobody fucking hooked that up for me. I had to work to get every sponsorship, like any shoe company or any of that shit. And then we would, I, would, I had friends that worked at the label for a minute. As soon as it like, all our friends started being fired from the label and anybody that cared about Cottonmouth Kings, that's a red flag. And they're like, yeah, dude, I don't understand it. One of the dudes was, was dude's best friend. And he was like, yeah, I'm being pushed out of the label. I don't know what's going on over there. Yeah, there's secret shit being said. They just pushed Violet Brown out of the company. Like, I don't know, dude. And then, and then when I told, got told by one of the rappers, like, hey, man, Homeboy's having a fake QuickBooks made. And I go, what do you mean a fake QuickBooks? And he said, a fake QuickBooks. It's designed to rip us all off. And I said, what the fuck are you telling me right now? He said, he's, he designed... He's, the, he's having a fake QuickBooks designed. Like, you know, he always says, like, you want to look at the computer screen and check the numbers? You know what I mean? Like, that was his shit. When, he, when you walked in his office, you want to see the numbers? You want to look at the fucking numbers on the screen? And so I'm like, wow, he's building. He, he said, yeah, I know the hacker dude that's building it. Well, Man, that was, that's getting that, was one of the, that was one of the first dudes who went back over there. You know, and some of these dudes in bands are, are like, going on tour and, like, plastering their, their stage with this dude's logo still. And I'm, I'm wondering, I'm like, and then you talk to any of the guys in the band, they're like, yeah, no, the lead singer takes all the money. We don't make shit. Did and you, I'm like, that's why, because they're not, they're not selling gear. The did, other dude is. Did you the know, one dude who's supposed to be their manager. 
Did you notice a change in uh, Brad's behavior at all over the years? Okay, okay, s fucking sorry, dude. You know I smoke a lot of weed, Jay. You know what I mean? Sorry <laughs> to get sidetracked. Let me answer your fucking question, bro. I love you, man. So check it. Yes, I absolutely did. Like, you know, we would be on tour and and um and uh we would get a we would get a record that was say say like it, it just got mixed, you know, and so it's out there. And keep, keep in mind, like, we finished the record, like, right before we left. And um, so I would have, like, my rough mix out there, showing basically Richter, Loke, and Pac in the back of the bus. The dude's in the back of the bus sitting there smoking weed all fucking day, right? I'm like, check out what I did to our new shit. And Richter and Loke are all about it because they just got done laying all their shit, too. So they're like, yeah, let's hear what you did. And so we would actually get in this groove of listening to this shit going, damn. This shit's fucking working. Damn, that face shit you put in there, dude. The 808s are fucking sick. They, you know, whatever I fucking did do it. And I'm not saying I fucking made a lot of our beats happen. Or t I'm not taking away from what Kuma guy did because he's a fucking master at what he does. Like those industrial hip hop beats that we had were like a lot of them were his feel and, and his creations. You know what I mean? And I, I touched on probably 95% of everything we ever released. And I was the one who came up with like, let's transition from hip hop into punk rock. And, and Brad's like, how are we going to do it? And I'm like, we can do it with the turntables and weird effects. And, you know, and now, now of course it's a different game with Serato. It'd be real easy now, but we were doing all everything with like foot pedals and whatever I happened to have on deck to make it happen back in the day, you know? And we were recording to two inch probably like you guys were back in the day, like yeah. the real Otari real, the real shit. It was a, a different monster in the studio before Pro Tools came out, you know? Oh yeah, yeah, no yeah. doubt. No doubt. So, so, uh, so, so, so Ray J, I'm going to answer you right now. So as we're in the bus and we're listening to these mixes and then Brad gets this, you know, the mixes or a CD out there or whatever it is. And he sticks it in the player and I walk up there and I say, Hey, you know, some, sometimes it's like a simple question of like, where's all my shit. Is this the final mix? Well, well, yeah, we're, it's already gone to the mastering guy, but you know, Bob, big bass, Bob that did NWA shit or this guy or what, whoever. I'm like, well, where, where's all my shit? I, I put a bunch of stuff in there. You ain't been listening to that rough mix? Can you talk to mom, my, my mom for me? You know, well, where's all my stuff, you know? And sometimes he would literally look at me, Jay, with like this blank stare. And it was the weirdest fucking thing. Like literally cleared our bus out a few times. Like a couple of times it was at home shows and like everybody in the bus would like literally you know, we just get quiet all of a sudden and then people are just walking out of the bus like unawkwardly and he's just sitting there and like, and, and yeah, like he starts sleeping from, you know, and I understand it's hard to sleep on tour and some people do fall asleep at five or six in the morning. We're pumped. We got off stage at fucking midnight or 12 or whatever it is. And maybe we're on an East coast schedule. You get, you guys know how it is. Sometimes you don't sleep at night on tour. It's fucking given no matter whether you're drinking or you're sober, or you're smoking, bud. you're on a fucked up schedule. Your life is different. You're eating different. Everything's fucked up. You don't get a shower all the time. Like, you know, and you guys did it super fucking dialed always a hotel room. Of course you guys had to fucking, you guys were a different animal because of, of the Fago thing and all that too. But uh, man, you guys were taken care of whether we were in the middle of nowhere or not. You guys understood you had to have those fucking things on deck. And those weren't, those things weren't always taken care of for us. And, and Brad didn't always making sure we were taken care of. We would show, we would pull up somewhere in the middle of fucking nowhere. You guys know how New Jersey and New York is. You're parking in New Jersey in the middle of fucking nowhere. And like Brad's all of a sudden gone. And I'm like, yo. And it's like Brad got a hotel room and he left with the tour manager and he's the only one that's getting a hotel room and we're paying for it. And we're all stuck on the bus for two days or some shit. Like that's wow. the reality of it, man. And, and just to be like out there as like five or six guys that are really making it happen. And, and, you know, like, and, and, I, and you got to understand why he wasn't there running the fuck out of the label. We toured, you know, dudes like Tommy Lee and heavy hitters in this fucking game are like, you guys tour more than everybody. And he goes like, you know, maybe ICP and some of those underground groups, but Jesus Christ, nobody does five or six days a week, seven days a week. You guys will go like 14 shows in a row. Mm -hmm. You guys like, if you have like a singer, like you usually can't do that. And I'm like, oh yeah, they're learning vocal exercises and all kinds of shit out there. He's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you guys know all about it because you guys are fucking going hard too. So you no doubt, man. Oh man. You know, so so of course he was sleeping. He, he sleep until four or five in the afternoon. Yeah, but so was I sometimes. If the sound check wasn't until seven, fucking sometimes I need to fucking sleep or you're gonna get sick out there. You guys know how hard it is to tour and not get sick. It's right. a motherfucker. You're changing climates and all that. So I started to notice that that and and just a disconnect from like 
you know, talking to us and informing us what's going on other than complaining about Kevin and what's going on at the label, but it was always a complaint and not a fix. And, you know, when guys like, I, I, I fucking got respect for Richter. Richter's always had a good heart. You know what I mean? And me and Richter fought on the bus twice, but I got more respect for Richter as far as any of the members. Um, you know, like Richter never in a sense turned his fucking back on me where everybody else turned their fucking back on me. And Richter's just like, you know, and I feel bad for Richter because Richter had problems with alcohol and drugs, obviously. And, um, he's coming up next, but I fucking got love for Richter and Richter's figured it out. He told me, you know, a while back I talked to him. He's like, yeah, we're starting this new group thing, whatever. And, I, and I'm super going for the sober thing and, and I need to do that. And I said, do it for fucking your health, your chick, your dogs. You know what I mean? And I go get on fucking point, Richter. And, and and I could be wrong, but I, Richter should own like a couple fucking houses. He wrote all the dope songs. He was the fucking driving force behind most of those records as far as lyrics goes. Richter could write. You guys know Richter could write and rap like a motherfucker. And if he was sober, he was fire. And, you know, Richter, uh, you know, fought the alcohol and drugs thing, and, and which a lot of artists do. And, and um, you know, and I, God bless Richter, but Richter should own a couple houses and doesn't. And you know, the guy that owned the clothing company that was getting pushed all through our branding um, owns like four houses or three houses and a fucking bunch of cars and an $80,000 lowrider and all kinds of shit. Wow. You know what I mean? And I'm just, I just, I'm like, it's so fucked off. And I get it. Like when you're the top dog, you're going to make more money and you're going to, you you make deals with people and that's the fucking deal. They either take it or they leave it and whatever. But in our case, like, you know, the SRH certificates and, and, and stuff like that. And deals were broken. And when they, and then they're telling me, we got you, dude, we're six figure deals by the end of this year. You know how many times I heard that six figures by the end of this deal. That's what you're looking at, bro. My last record was called six figure deal. Just in spite of that fucking comment, you know what I mean? And, and keep in mind, I put out 16 records last year. I got my own label called wave division. Um, I got the real DJ Bobby B.com and that's my own shit. And I, and it's not all my records. I put out like, what, eight or nine by myself. I put all my old shit back out and I put one session as three records out. Our boy p has records. Our boy Mellow Dust has two or three records and we've made Wave Division records, which is like vibed out. If you want to just vibe out on some shit and trip, listen to some instrumental hip hop with instruments and the whole shit, it's super cool. So, so and I've been back to DJing this fucking, these live sets, like, and Shaggy's rated me a couple times. It's been fucking rad when everybody jumps in. Like, Jay, I don't know if you know, but I rock. I rock, you know what I mean? I'm no fucking doubt. playing chicken hunting. I'm scratching chicken he, he hunting into some down, fucking uh, yeah. Steve Miller band and then going back into fucking Shaggy Tudo fuck off and then into Piggy fucking Woogie Woo and fucking dude, I'm <laughs> I'm jumping to the shit. Hell yeah. And tonight, hey man, I'm tonight, not to like plug what I'm fucking doing at all because this is some plug serious it, shit. Yeah. I love you guys for doing this. I love you guys for doing this. And like, I was waiting a week or two ago and I said, you know what? They're getting it all together and they're going to launch this shit correct. And look at the production team, DJ Clay and everybody just fucking making this shit nice. Fuck you yeah. know what I mean? Everybody <laughs> like. I got a question. I got, I got one more question. Sorry to cut you off. I, I got one no. more question for you. Um, If, if let's say D-Lo, Let's say Lou Dog, let's say Johnny Richter, let's say Dirtball, all wanted to come together. Are you in without Brad? The, the only way I would do it is if you made it happen, Jay. Oh, shit. Straight the fuck okay. up. Straight up. No, okay. no, no serious. Like, dude, Violent fucking love and respect you, dude. And, and, dude, there's not a lot of people I could say, like, I mean, we ain't fucking tight homies. We don't talk on the phone all the time. But, dude, like, what I went through with you guys and, like, yeah, that's the only way I would do it is if it was super proper and it was, like, meant to be something like that because I can't fuck with nobody in the past. You guys got to understand that. It's not about, like, the legacy or dissing the fans or not coming together for the fans because I love the fans. That's the only reason I fucking twitch. Some nights I make fucking $12 straight yeah. up. Straight up. I mean, you guys fucking got it going on. I make $12 some nights when I fucking spend for like six hours. So I'm doing it for the fucking fans, trust me. And I played a Cottonmouth instrumental the other night. First time I played any Cottonmouth shit on there and people were tripping, but I play you guys almost every fucking stream. I'll rock in some ICP and there's always, you know, Juggalo Darcy, fucking John Doe Juggalo. It's always some Juggalos in there that are like big up and they'll even sit through like, you know, I play like dance remixes, Katronada and some weird like heartfelt shit. They stay now. They're, they realize I'm going to fucking mix out quick. I'm on the decks getting it. 
You guys are ever in LA, come over here and let's just fucking get down. For I got sure. MPC, I, sure, I got we'll MPCs be, all over the room, turntables all over the room, and we fucking could get down and just we'll have be fun. There, we'll be in LA second week of January. Let's get together. Yeah, for sure, brother. <laughs> yeah, right. No uh, doubt, man. Thank you, man. Hell yeah, Thank man. you guys. Thank you, Shout out to Bobby, Bobby B, B, man. Hell you're yeah. the shit, man. We love you, man. For real. Hey. You're, you're a real one, man. You know that? <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Love you guys, too. Hey, and shout out to Richter, man. I always come on here next, man. I got love for the dude, man. I'm glad he's figuring shit out. And, and, and you know, God bless what he's doing and shit. So, Hell yeah, man. You know, it ain't, yeah. it ain't all negative and, and hate, guys. It's fucking, it's just all reality and facts and super gnarly what I went through. And you guys know, like most artists, we're all in touch with our emotions. I know you guys are, too, because I've been around you guys. So it's like, it's gnar it was gnarly for me, man. I've caught my breath now, and I could actually talk, but... You know what I mean? Hey, fucking man. hey, if I'm gonna spin later, Jay, please come check it out. Like when I first get on there, I'm gonna put it like play a couple instrumentals, whatever, but then I'm gonna I'm gonna rock some shit for you guys. For Straight sure, up. man. <laughs> for sure. Everybody <laughs> check it out, man. That's Everybody dope. watch. You know what I'm saying? Fuck yeah. Love Hell it. Yeah. Love it. Keep it moving, man. Well, thank right, you. Man. Thank you, brother man. Yeah, we love you, man. You, we'll man, see you uh second week of January, man. Fuck yeah, let's do it. Let's get together, hey, bro. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. 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 Right, Word so up, Rob. Word up, Shaggy. Okay, yeah. what's up, man? Love you. Take care. So uh, that that ride he was talking about when we were, we were in the van together, uh, I actually the tour bus driver left me. You know what I mean? I was the road manager at the time. This was like way back. Oh, in you the been, day. They, they left you on bus call? I was the, yeah. I, they let the bus left without me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, <laughs> so then I was like, fuck, how am I gonna get to the next city? You know? And so Cop Mile Kings were still there, and at the time they were gripping a van. So they had a van with like like ten dudes in it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was like, man, I know this is a fucking stretch, but can y'all give me a ride, you know? Hell, like, fuck yeah, jump in, you know? And they gave me the shotgun seat. Wow. I felt so bad about it. I was, no, man, I fucking sit in the back. They were like, nah, they refused. They were That's like, That's the kind of dudes you gotta are, you gotta sit up mm -hmm. front, you know? And we're packed in there going. To, and it was like it was cool though, cause I got a chance to bond with them. Like, you know, talking to everybody for, like, fucking six hours or whatever. The That's next dope, thing. man. Now, that uh, that uh, that SRH they're talking about, now, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I know it was Kevin Zinger's production and clothing company, and he started that before Count Mouth.